Okay, good morning. Welcome. Uh, thanks so much for joining me this morning and investing some time in your professional development. If you're watching this uh, pre recorded, thanks for tuning in. Uh, this is the first webinar of our summer series fun and engaging literacy activities for elementary school. I will be doing four of these and I will be going over lots and lots of different ideas that you can put to use in your classroom and this is mostly geared toward elementary school however with literacy uh, with reading instruction if your students are still in the learning to read phase even beyond elementary school then uh, some of these activities and strategies would certainly be applicable beyond elementary school so i am tiffany rao and I teach in the Department of Special Education here at Cal State Fullerton. These are general uh, that you could use in any classroom. It doesn't have to be special education, but I will definitely be talking about how to um, accommodate students with disabilities throughout. So today's uh, webinar, I'm going to focus on building literacy skills through art exploration. So I am going to I am going to um, share with you two lessons directly from the Getty Museum website. The Getty Museum has an amazing library of lesson plans and all of the links of artwork to go with it, the PDF files that you can share with your students. A lot of them are really, really just pretty low prep. You don't need much beyond what you already have in the classroom, which is really nice. You don't have to go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff. So I really recommend checking out uh, the Getty Museum website and just kind of search around for their uh, lesson plans and you will see it's very extensive, really high quality. I'm also going to share a couple of um, lessons and activities that I've done in my own practice. So, oh, let me put the link to the slides in, um, in the chat, and that way you can access them. All right, there we go. Okay. So first I wanna show this planning pyramid. I really like this. I used this all the time in my planning as a teacher. It's very simple. Of course, this isn't all that you would use in your planning, but I really appreciate this framework for when you have um, a classroom of very diverse learners who have all over the place goals, right? So if you are teaching, um, a general education class, you know that you have students who are very, you know, advanced and students who really need more basic skills. But then if you're teaching, let's say a first through third or fourth through sixth special day class, your students are really going to cover a lot of different skills and goals that they need to learn. And if you're RSP, same thing, right? So, uh, this planning pyramid, as you can see down at the bottom, this is where you might, if you were to just, I used to do this all the time, I would just draw a triangle and divide it into three parts, just like this. And I would quickly, nothing formal, jot down what components of what I was about to teach could all students do, all students. So I'm gonna use an example of, let's say, I'm going to do this later on in the webinar. Let's say you teach your students how to draw a, uh, a character or an animal or something. They draw something and then you want them to sort of write a story about it. Maybe write a paragraph or a couple of sentences, depending on the grade level. You might have them write a full story or you might just have them write one or two sentences if it's kindergarten, right? So let's just say that basic example, you have your students draw a picture and then you want them to write about the picture. So all students maybe in your class could draw a simple picture. 
And then all of them could give some kind of a response to that picture. So for some students, it might be writing two sentences, but at least they would all maybe dictate a sentence to you or your aide or a peer, and then you write it, right? And then some students would write a full paragraph. In terms of the art, maybe all students can at, at uh, the very least trace a picture and most students could draw the picture and then some students could draw the picture and add some details to it. So this can be really helpful when you're planning an inclusive lesson where you want to incorporate several different IEP goals and common core standards and just uh, learning uh, objectives, general learning objectives of your lesson. So keep this in mind as I'm talking about the lessons and activities that I'm going to share with you. Okay, so the first lesson that I'm going to share with you is from the Getty. And it uh, here is the link is right here for this exact lesson. I'm going to share with you an overview of the lesson and a basic outline of the lesson plan. But if you want the detailed lesson plan and links to the PDF files, go to this link right here. Uh, the lesson plan is originally developed for grades K through two, but I would argue that it could be higher. This is a lesson that I can see really incorporating several different IEP goals, um, K through six, or even higher. It's, it's a fun lesson, uh, so it just kind of depends on your students. Okay, I'm not gonna read all of this, but I just wanna show you how many standards are addressed. So I copied and pasted this from the lesson. Uh, over here, these are all the common core standards that are addressed just in this simple art lesson. And it's connected to poetry as well. So it's art and literacy together. So many common core standards addressed. Also visual art, art content standards addressed and uh, more general ELA content content standards are addressed uh, in addition to the different kinds of IEP goals that you could address for your own students. So these are the lesson, lesson basics. So again, the uh, I forgot to say the name, it's natural balance in photography and poetry. So uh, here's the lesson basics. Here's the original author. It was a second grade teacher who wrote this lesson. Uh, it could be a three to five part lesson, the way that it's written, 50 minutes each. But if you know your class and you have a first grade class and they don't really focus on one thing for more than 20 minutes, then I encourage you to break it up into more parts for lesser time at a time. So uh, we're going to be making cyanotypes and cyanotypes are an early type of photography. You, you can use um, sun print paper or it's also called nature paper, or I'll also talk about how you can just use construction paper. Uh, so students will uh, brainstorm a list of adjectives to describe these cyanotypes they will create their own cyanotype photograph, and then they will write a poem using that list of adjectives that they uh, came, that you all came up with as a class. So the basic objectives here are brainstorm a list of adjectives, answer in complete sentences, write a poem using adjectives, and create a balanced photograph. But you can definitely adjust those to reflect your, your students. So a cyanotype is so cool. It's a 180 year old camera-less photographic print that prints in a distinctive dark blue. So they're actually creating a photograph but without using a camera. It was invented in 1842 by scientist and astronomer, Sir John Herschel. You can look up more information on that to share kind of a background with your students. It's really interesting. You'll want to front load them with some vocabulary. So here are some vocabulary words that they would probably need. And that would be cyanotype, maybe also just talk about nature, photography, and then some elements of art, specifically line, shape, and balance. And when I say balance, I'm talking about the distribution 
of objects and space in art. So I'll show you an example of what I mean by that. You probably are already familiar, but your students probably are not. So here is one example. This is from the Getty, one of their PDFs of a cyanotype. This one was in 1842, uh, from 1842, called The Arrangement of Specimens by Hippolyte, Hippolyte Bayard. And you would open up the lesson by sharing this, um, this print, this PDF with your students, just taking a look at it. Uh, again, well, again, you'll open up by, with the vocabulary. And then the next part is sharing this print and just observing and talking about it. So here are some guiding questions. What do you see? Allow students to just talk about what they see, get that language going. What kind of lines do you see? And you might need to model how to really look closely for the lines. For example, I see a long line here in the middle of this fern looking piece of a plant. I see a stem here that makes a line. I see the line coming down in this feather. And then, oh, look at this. I see a lot of lines going in all different directions. And so you might want to give your students some of that language. If you have students with speech and language delay, then modeling the language first is very important. In a general ed class where you might not have any students with speech and language delay, you can just open up the question with uh, open up the discussion with questions, make it very open-ended. They may not need that level of modeling, but if you're working with students who need it, then definitely give them the language first and then invite them in to add their own ideas and their own uh, pieces. You might uh, require full sentences in this discussion if that's a goal that your students are working on, or if the goal is just to get them talking more, then I wouldn't put a lot of requirements on the language if the goal is just to pull out the language from your students. So what kind of lines do you see? What kind of shapes do you see? What objects do you see? So obviously you see here a feather, some flowers. This looks like it might have been a flat, might be a flower with a lot of different spindly uh, leaves perhaps not sure what that is. You guys could have a discussion about what that might be. And then you can ask, what would you have named this work of art if you had made it yourself? Once you've had that discussion, sorry, this is coming out a little bit blurry, but once you've had that discussion, then you will brainstorm a list of adjectives and uh, you can divide up the adjectives into different categories, such as color, size, texture, and shape. So I would have a, uh, a graphic a table um, up visually for the students that you're filling in alongside this. So now we're gonna brainstorm a list of adjectives to describe this. So it would be, you know, color, we see blue and white, size, ask the students, what, how would you describe the size of these objects? What do you think the texture is like? Does this look smooth? Does this look soft? Does this look uh, pokey? Uh, and then what shapes do you see? Brainstorm those adjectives, write them up here because then they will use these to help them write their own poem later, which we'll get to the poem. Here's another example of a cyanotype. This one's from 1854 by Anna Atkins and Ann Dixon. And, uh, and the title is up here. I forgot to Google how to pronounce it, so I'm not gonna try. Uh, but uh, that one, this one is a really great example of balance. So we're gonna talk about that. So again, what do you see? What kind of lines do you see? What kind of shapes do you see? What objects do you see? And then does this work have balance? So you say, remember when we talked about balance and balance means kind of just, you know, looking at the objects, do, does it look like it would have balance? You could even show uh, or share if you have some kind of a uh, balance scale, right? So is this balanced? If I fold it in half, would it almost uh, fit together? Would it be almost like a mirror image? So does this have balance? Why do you think that? And then what would you have called this work of art if you had made it? Okay, hold on just a 
second. So then you would have students create their own cyanotype. So I have one right here. Let me just pause the share. I think you should be able to see me right here. See mine? I could put, look at it like this or like this. And I wanted to create balance. So you would talk about talk to your students about balance and how uh, you want to try and create balance on this. So this was a leaf that I found in my backyard. Let me show you the paper. So this, mine is really small. It comes in all different sizes. So it's right here, sun print kit. And it comes with everything that you need to create a sun print, which includes, let me just pull it out, the paper, which actually is a lighter shade of blue when you first start, when you before you put it out in the sun. See, it's a little bit lighter. This is what it looks like when it starts. And you put one sheet, the instructions are on here, but I'm just gonna show you. You take a piece of cardboard, put the sheet on top, gather sticks, uh, leaves, flowers, anything in nature. So your students would go out on a little nature hunt to find some objects that they would wanna put on their sun print paper. They lay them all out in the sun and then it comes with this acrylic, this clear acrylic piece here. They put it on top out in the sun for one to five minutes only, too long and it won't work. Um, and then bring it in and you actually rinse it under cool water. So it's sort of like developing a photograph, um, kind of like uh, taking a negative and developing it. So when it is, before it's rinsed off and developed, right after that one to five minutes, this looks opposite. Uh, so this inside is actually the dark blue and this outside is actually white or kind of white, lighter. Then you rinse it off, let it set for a few minutes. I put something heavy on it once it was dry to flatten it out because it got a little bit warped and then it becomes like this. So it's a really neat process um, of developing a photographic print without a camera. So they would create their own cyanotype. Now, let me tell you though, okay, the sun print paper is cool. Uh, it runs about on Amazon, about eight to $15 for one pack of maybe, I think, I think this came with 20, 20 pieces. Um, and I don't want, I mean, I don't want you guys spending your own money. So you can like $8 yourself into spending hundreds of dollars on your classroom over the course of the year, right? We all know that. So you don't have to use this fancy paper. If you're wanting to teach about the, um, the like photography and the, the process of photography, then that might be a good investment. If you also have a wish list or, uh, you know, you ask for parent donations, or if your school is will gives you uh, a budget, uh, then maybe use that. Uh, but otherwise, unless you're really wanting the sun print paper, or you wanted to teach about the process of photography, you can just use construction paper. Now construction paper is going to be a little bit different. I don't have an example of that, but it's going to like, if this was construction paper, let's say, it would still be this blue color. No, no, no. The blue color would fade and underneath the leaf would be still this blue color. Does that make sense? So you're really making a faded print and it, then you don't rinse it underwater or do any of that. You don't have to put a clear plastic thing on top of it. Just arrange some things on construction paper, leave it out for an hour or more, an hour, two, three hours, do it in the morning when the sun is hot, check, bring it in after lunch kind of a thing. And then you will still get kind of that same effect and it will still be great. So use what's free. That's my recommendation, but I also wanted to share the sun print paper with you because that's what they use in the original. All right. So They'll create their own cyanotype. Uh, that would maybe be like day two. So day one, you introduce it, share those PDFs. Day two, they create their own. And then day three, you would guide them to write a balanced 
poem based on their cyanotype. So here is one example of a balanced poem. And if, well, I included all of these descriptives over next to the poem, but if I took these out, which I should have I had a slide with these out, you would see that this poem is very balanced. It would be sort of like a, um, a diamond shape. Okay, so you can talk about the, uh, the visual aspect of a balanced poem. The formula or template for this poem is the title is one item that you see, then two adjectives related to size, three adjectives related to shape, three adjectives related to appearance, two related to texture, and then, and then a synonym for the title or a close word for the title. Uh, you might need to teach what a synonym is or Hopefully you already would have. If you haven't, then maybe make the last word the same as the title if they're not ready for synonyms. So like you, as you can see, this is really going to come in handy for writing their balanced poem. So they create their cyanotype and then they would write a balanced poem based on their cyanotype. So again, this would be a few days, I would say at least three. And this would be a really cool thing to share uh, at back to school night or share with parents. Just it's not a last minute kind of a uh, lesson you would want to plan ahead. OK, the next one is another Getty lesson, and it is called I Spy Irises. Again, grades K through two, but I think that you could go higher than that. Here's all of the standards that it covers. And this one is related to Van Gogh. And actually this one was originally written by a uh, first grade intensive autism teacher. So already a lot of great accommodations and support is built into this original lesson plan, which is really nice. So this was a single class lesson that this teacher did about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, it was designed for students with autism goes over the elements of art, specifically colors, shapes, and different types of lines. Uh, they identify these elements in Van Gogh's painting, Irises. And then they practice drawing different types of lines and shapes and uh, flowers. And then they produce a crayon resist piece inspired by Van Gogh's painting. So first you might, uh, you would start out by reading this book if you can get a hold of it. Um, it is called Camille and the Sunflowers. You might check the library. There are other books about Van Gogh's work as well. So if you can't find this one, you can look for another one. This one's uh, really great. Uh, I think really engaging. Before you do that, you might need to teach or review the elements of art, specifically color, shapes, and lines. Then you would read the book. And what I always like to do when I'm reading aloud to students is I do at least two read throughs the first time. And then I will read it repeatedly throughout the week. Students really start to love a book after they've heard it several times because it's now familiar, it's predictable. That's something that innately feels very good to students. But the first time I would read it just once, no questions just enjoy the book, just take it in. And then another read through where then we would take a closer look at some of the illustrations and uh, talk about some of these discussion questions. What do you see? What colors, shapes, lines? Have you ever seen flowers like these? Oh, where did you see them? Um, where do you think Van Gogh was when we painted, when he painted this work of art? Why do you think that? Um, and you can share that he was outside in a garden. And then the same discussion questions would apply to sharing the PDF of irises, which is what I have right here. But I would ask these questions while you read the book and then also apply it to the PDF. And then you will probably get a little bit more advanced discussion that way because you've practiced. So then the students would create crayon resist watercolor flowers. If you have not used crayon resist, it is a really fun technique 
to use in elementary school, especially when you're using a lot of crayons anyways. So you would first want to model how to draw a few simple flowers. It doesn't have to be irises. So you could give them, because irises are a little bit complicated. You could model how to draw an iris if you feel confident with that, but you can also just do a simple tulip, daisy, sunflower. And as you're modeling it, be sure to verbalize, verbally point out the shapes and the lines that you're using. Really think aloud. Okay, I'm going to draw a long line here for the stem. I'm going to make it a little bit curved. Do you see how it's just a little bit curved? That makes it look more natural. So you really want to talk through. Then you can pass out plain paper, have students practice drawing their own flowers. After they've practiced, show some pictures of flowers, show some real flowers, and then allow students to go outside and observe flowers. Again, making that connection back to the lines and the shapes and the colors that they see. You can show, make it a kinesthetic experience by showing students how to trace the flowers in the air that they're observing. Then pass out some watercolor paper uh, if, if you have that, um, or at least some pretty decent white uh, construction paper, if nothing else. Have students, they can start with pencil if they want, uh, but then they're going to go over the pencil or just freehand with crayons to draw the flowers that they observed. Encourage them to press hard with the crayons. That's important for this technique. Talk to them, why are you using that color? Oh, look at that shape. What shape are you using? What line, what are your lines like? Get them talking. Once they're finished drawing, you're gonna pass out watercolor, uh, watercolors and water and show them how to make a wash out of green, green and blue paint and paint over the entire drawing to create the crayon resist. So here are some examples of that, of some different flowers. These I believe look like dandelions and they just did green and blue wash. So the, as you can see, the student used dandy, uh, used green to make the dandelion stems, green crayon. Looks like they used some yellow to make some of the dandelion flowers and then the white uh, dandelion seeds, probably a white crayon. So you're not gonna see the white crayon initially, but then when you paint over it, it's really gonna show up nicely. Here's an example with some tulips. And with these tulips, it looks like they did use white to paint the out, to draw the outline of the tulip and then uh, red watercolor inside, green watercolor in those leaves and stems and a blue wash on the outside. Over here, it looks like they used yellow crayon to draw color in the vase, blue crayon to color in the bottom of the vase. Uh, so crayon coloring in and then and then some squiggly lines of crayon in the background and then a blue wash over all of it. So I would experiment yourself beforehand and you may or may not want to offer choices. If you offer too many choices, that can be overwhelming. So you might just experiment with some different approaches and then choose one and teach that at least in the beginning. And then this is a great technique that you can apply to uh, other, other lessons. Okay, so now I'm gonna share with you something that I have done with students in the past. And I own this book that's up on the screen. So here it is. It is called Drawing Animals Shape by Shape. And the author is Christopher Hart. And he has so many great books. He all, this one's really simple. This one's great for, for kinder, maybe even some preschoolers could do this, uh, but definitely kinder and up. Uh, but he also does more advanced books. I didn't even realize, I think we have some in this house uh, on drawing anime and manga and uh, or manga and uh, comic style uh, characters. Really, really great step-by-step. Step. Let me pause the share and just show you some of these, I'm just gonna open it up to this one. Let me start over here. So it's step by step. Now what I would do with students is draw this on the board. This is what I have done. And as I'm drawing it, I number it. 
And I don't know if you want to draw, if you want to write in a book, how you feel about that. Uh, but you could even put like a clear plastic over it and just dry erase. I would number it one, two, three, four, five to make it more clear for some students. But this is so simple, such simple shapes. And then here it is all colored with some more details added. What I like is that he adds like kind of fun faces. So sometimes the animals look a little bit sneaky or menacing or angry or just cute like this one. And it is so doable. So I've done this with a group of uh, uh, first through third graders, and they all came out so good, varying levels of artistic uh, readiness, and they all turned out really good. It's kind of like when you go to those paint nights, and it looks really complicated, and then everybody's, whoops, everybody's uh, ends up looking really good. Oh, hold on just one second. Where is it? lost my slides. Let me start it up again. Okay, sorry, let me get back to it. Okay. So the way that I used to teach a lesson from this book, but it's so um, flexible, you can really do it in a lot of different ways. I would use uh, 10, to, 10 to 15, you don't really even need that much time, instructional time for how to draw the animal, where I would model doing it on the board step by step. And then, uh, and then have the students do it. And that might take them 10, 15 minutes to draw it on their own. Then you might put that away and come back the next day. And I would meet with students one-on-one -on -one to help them develop a character out of their drawing. So some kind of character and story development. As they get good at drawing these, you can kind of talk about how to make different facial expressions. So how to make a uh, and, and one of the characters look a little sneaky or look worried and moving their, you know, adjusting their eyebrows and their, their smirk or something like that. So that's kind of fun. But talk about a character and what's the story behind the character. And then you would give them time to write a rough draft and then edit into a story. For grades, uh, this I would say this is appropriate for grades K through six, and you can, uh, of course, adjust the, um, the student outcomes. So it might just be one sentence for lower grades or for students who are uh, just at that level, and then it might be a whole story for upper grades or students who are ready. Some of the object objectives are just following a step-by-step -step instructions, developing a character, and then writing a sentence or a story based on their animal character. So here's uh, just the overview. overview. I, I guess I think I already went over most of this actually, but in your one-on-one -on -one conferences, you can ask the following prompts like, oh, look at this cool animal that you made. What's the animal's name? Have you thought of a name? How do you think the animal's feeling right now? Oh, he feels, he feels worried. Why? What's going on? Where's the animal going? What is the problem the animal is facing? So this is how you're developing a story through teacher conferencing. You can do this. Your aides can do this. If you have parent volunteers, you can train them on how to do this. It's really simple and it's fun. And then the students would write a rough draft of their story. If they are at the level of just dictating a story and you write it for them, great. You just, if that's their level, that is fine. There is nothing wrong with that. That helps them understand that their ideas can get put onto paper. So that is a first step to writing. Um, if they're ready to put their thoughts onto paper themselves, great. Uh, you can consider peer editing in editing towards that final draft or more teacher conferencing. Uh, so yeah, that's that one. Uh, I had another really good book that I can't find anymore. 
that was something about drawing step by step. And it did number each step of the drawing. And I used, they were so simple. I used it in my kindergarten SDC class when I had that grade level. And I would teach it to them. Uh, I would make it into a quick little mini lesson and model it to them. And then I would run off copies from the book. They made really good, just like worksheets. And I would put them at a drawing center or writing center. And my students really enjoyed after I taught them and they got a little practice drawing them, then they enjoyed doing it again and again as they got better and better. So there's a lot of good books on Amazon besides this one. Just look up like a uh, step-by-step drawing. There's step-by-step drawing for people and for uh, this one's animals. It's uh, flowers, all kinds of things, all by different authors too. Okay, and then this one that I wanted to share, this I got, um, the images and a lot of the lesson details from this website down here. Here's the link for the full um, the full lesson. But I did things very similar with my students in that kindergarten class. Uh, this is mostly geared towards kindergarten first grade, but I really think that you could extend it beyond and make it a little more uh, challenging. So Painted Elephant Art Project, this is connected to Eric Carl's book, The Artist Who Drew a Blue Horse. So it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to read the book and then 10 to 30 minutes per day to complete the elephant painting. You could do that over two to four days. The objectives are that they'll listen to and discuss the book, follow some step-by-step -step directions and describe their painting and provide detail. So the first thing that you would do is read the book, The Artist Who Painted a Blue Horse by Eric Carle. It's a great book. It's a little bit, uh, it's autobiographical about Eric Carle. Lots of wonderful illustrations, just like he always has. And as you read the book, you can discuss how many different colors do you see? What different shades of these colors are there? Uh, what, how many shades of blue do you see? Or how many shades of red do you see? What would you call each shade? Uh, look at the posture of each animal. Is, do you think this animal is moving or standing still? How do you know? So you really, every time that you read a book, especially a picture book, you want to get students talking about the book, about the pictures, and about what's going on. So these are some great questions, and you can consider, um, you can consider using these questions in other similar books. What I like about this is, let's go back. This is the example. They don't just pass out. In the lesson plan, they don't just pass out orange paper and have students cut shapes out of orange paper and create an elephant. First step is to paint a big white sheet of paper orange. So they make their own orange paper. You could have, if you want them all to match and you want them all to do orange, they can all be orange elephants. Or like Eric Carle, part of, the, part of the point of that book is that he didn't paint things the right colors. So you could have students choose whatever color they want to paint the elephant. So first they'll paint a big sheet of paper orange or let them choose the color and then give them another big sheet of paper and you're gonna have them paint a sky and grass. That's it allow that to dry for a day. So that's day one is reading the book and then just the prep paint. The next day you would have students practice drawing an elephant. So the original way that this lesson is written is to look at pictures of elephants, talk about the shapes and the lines. You can model a little bit, but really have students do an observational drawing where they are observing the elephant closely. You'll want to model that and then trying to draw the elephant. But some options would be to... Um, would be to provide a template for tracing. If your students just aren't there yet in terms of observational drawing, you can provide a, um, a template for tracing that they can cut out and then trace onto their blue, I, I mean, onto their orange paper. So that would be another uh, option. 
students will, whether they trace it or whether they draw it themselves, then they cut out their elephant out of the orange paper and then glue it onto the sky grass painting. Then they will add details. You can use markers or more paints uh, or, or cutting out papers, like cut out white circles for the eyes, add black pupils, draw some flowers on the ground, uh, you know, draw their toes, draw some shading or lines on the trunk, things like that. And yeah, that's it for that lesson. And then I have one more thing that I want to share with you. So I gave you several um, Getty less, I gave you two Getty lessons, sorry. And I, I shared that there are a lot more Getty lessons on the website. I wanted to show you a clip of a special education teacher teaching a lesson from the Getty Museum. I really, really like this example. This is high school but I think you can get a lot out of it and apply it to elementary school or any level as well. I'm gonna show you the short clip. It's a little over three minutes. The longer clip is 15 minutes, uh, but you can uh, go ahead and watch that yourself if you're interested. This teacher is great. Let me pull it up. Now we're Okay, let me just fix my share. To the project Sorry. where- Second. Make sure my sound is optimized. Okay, here we go. You are gonna have to create a portrait. One of my strategies is the I do, we do, you do. Every time I introduce a new concept, I'm gonna do that. There might be a student that doesn't need modeling, but there's always a student that does. So why wouldn't I provide that scaffold for them? So every time I ask them to do something, I, I model it first. My students are not only in mild to moderate special education, but they're also long-term English language learners. You're each going to get a portrait scenario, okay? You're gonna have to create a portrait. I'll show you, here's the sample photo. <laughs> I don't know if you oh recognize <laughs> Miss Talbot, and that's me, and this is our example portrait. But it's important to show students how we think. So when I introduced the final project, I had an example of what I wanted the finished project to be, and I had a graphic organizer up that was blank, which looked identical to theirs, and I had the synopsis. This is the sample. Look up here and follow along. This is a portrait of two sisters who are very good girls. The I do part is just me modeling how I'm thinking about the picture. I'm just thinking aloud. So I need to think, how can I portray this? So I'm going to start and I'm going to say, okay, sisters who are very good girls. The whole thing is a gradual release of responsibility from teacher to student. What kind of clothing would I wear if I were Modest. a good girl? Ooh. At this point, I'm not asking for student participation, but they, they might jump in and say something and that's fine, but I can't at that point then say, oh, they all get it <laughs> and just skip to the you do, you know, because two people chimed in, but I had 12 students there today. So I have to assume that maybe 10 we're still listening or kind of not, not there yet. But when I first started teaching, I would have said, great, they got it. Okay, let's move on. You guys do. <laughs> so then I moved on and I did the we do. So the we do portion of the lesson is really, you're still providing prompting. And that's really what we do means is that I'm not leaving him hanging. Sorry, are you guys able to see this? I just noticed it says my screen sharing is paused and I keep trying to share it. Are you able to see this? It stays like in the frame, but you hear her talking. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. Let's see, let me try this instead. Nope, that doesn't seem right. Okay, how about that? They study all the time. I think I can show that by props. What would I be holding if I studied all the time? Books. 
so you do was the actual project. So then I said, okay, now you're ready to do it, and I gave each group their synopsis and their graphic organizer. And then, okay, the grandparents are going to be, you're going to be the grandfather, you're going to be the grandmother. He has to wear like a beard. I found that the clearer I am, the better quality work I see from the students. And because the students know what they're doing, they feel safe learning new things. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Hopefully you got to see some of it. Uh, all right. Okay. And that was the end of, uh, of my slides. Uh, hey, Seema, nice to see you. All right, so uh, thanks so much for joining. Uh, any questions or anything that you guys want to share before I share with you the survey? Uh, can you share the PowerPoint with us? Oh, yes, definitely. Link or something. Yeah, thank you. Yes, no problem. I'm gonna put that in the chat so you can access those slides and then you will have all of the links uh, that I shared as well to the different lesson plans. That's awesome. Thank you. I really like it. I was just browsing the Getty Image uh, Museum yeah. um, uh, website and they have a lot of good stuff for all grade levels. That's awesome. They do. I'm going to stop recording. Um,